It's a great privilege and pleasure to have a chance to talk to another old Sedbergian, Tom Bingham. Um, Tom, I always start by asking people when and where they were born. London W1 in October 1933. Right. And um, how far would you like to go back? Can you tell me anything about your grandparents, for example? Yes. Um, <clears throat> my father's parents uh, lived in Belfast in the north of Ireland. Um, they had four children, three daughters and a son. Um, my father was obviously the son and was number three in the batting order, so to speak. Um, they, my grandfather was an unqualified solicitor's clerk, although it annoyed my father very much once when I described him in that way. But that is, in fact, what he was. Um, and my father left school at 14 and became a pupil teacher, which was a way of continuing your education in return for teaching the younger children. Uh, and he did that, I think, for a year or two and decided that he wasn't born to be a teacher, which was undoubtedly true. Uh, and he decided he wanted to be a doctor. And the problem, of course, was that he didn't have uh, matric or anything like that. And to get matric in those days, you had to get a credit in Latin. So he started from scratch to learn Latin, which he did phenomenally quickly. Um, got his matric, uh, qualified in medicine, Queen's University, or fast. How did you get the money? Because his father well, was... the thing about Queen's University in those days was it was colossally cheap. Um, and I think it, it's true in Wales and Scotland and Ireland that um, sort of qualifying in medicine particularly, but also the law to some extent, is sort of a very recognised path to sort of rise up the social scale. And I, I don't think that was my father's ambition, but uh, to some extent was the effect. Mm -hmm. uh, and he later went back and uh, did a doctorate in medicine got a diploma in public health at the same time. He claimed to be the only person ever to have done those two degrees at the same time. <laughs> um, and they stopped it <laughs> afterwards. Anyway, he, he um, qualified in medicine and went to Wales to get a job. Uh, and there he, he met my mother. She was the youngest of four daughters. And the family history was actually well wrong. In a unusual, her father had gone out to California in quite early days and started um, a ranch in the High Sierra country west of uh, in, in California. Uh, and he had a big ranch there where these four children uh, were born. And it was said to be the family tradition is um, that he had the first herd of Hereford cattle west of the Rockies. Uh, but he, apparently his health failed and uh, the family which came from the Isle of Man returned to the Isle of Man in about 1903 and he died the following year. So my mother was actually brought up in the Isle of Man, went to school in Liverpool uh, by her mother. Uh, she also qualified in medicine and dentistry uh, and went this is your mother? Or My mother. Yeah. Uh, and, and she also found herself working in Swansea, in, in South Wales. And that's where they met and, and got married. Have you got connections with Wales? Because I see you've taken your lordship's title from Wales. We have a holiday house in Wales mm. that we've had for a very long time. Mm. And um, so we're sort of, we, we know that it was, well, my wife and I have a drop of Welsh blood, but we've become adoptive. Mm. Sort of world citizens. Because you also added Wales to the title of Lord Chief Justice or one of your titles. Yes, I did. Um, I found myself, when I was Lord Chief Justice, being asked to open a new county court in Swansea at a time when Welsh devolution was quite a hot potato and mm. people felt strongly about this, particularly in Swansea where people were in favour of it. Uh, and they asked me to approve a plaque which said opened by the Lord Chief Justice of England. 
<laughs> which is the formal title of the yeah. office, mm. was. Um, and it just seemed to me this was grotesque mm. uh, in its sort of insult to the Welsh. Um, so I said to the Lord Chancellor, I would like to say, and Wales as well, and he said, well, better consult colleagues, but uh, um, sounds like a good idea to me. So he came back a day or two later and said, yes, if what is delighted. <laughs> um, and the great thing was that the Welsh for England and Wales is Cumbria Loga, Wales and England. Sitting <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in the right order. <laughs> yeah. tell, tell me something about um, your parents uh, as people and their characters and how that might have influenced you, I mean, academically or in any other way. Well, I was much closer to my mother in a way. says remote, that gives a more impression on me. He was there all the time. Mm. Um, distant, distant session. Yes. I mean, he... Uh, well, I, I was just much closer to my mother, really, and her tastes and interests are much closer to mine. Mm. What were her tastes and interests? Well, she liked reading, and she was interested in history, although her own education was mm. primarily scientific. Mm. Did you have brothers and sisters? I had an older sister, mm -hmm. who unfortunately died of breast cancer in New York about 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So, um, she, But she, her husband was actually, at one stage, a fellow of this college. Really? Um, I think, whether he was a full-blown fellow, I'd mm -hmm. rather question. I think he may have been some sort of junior research fellow or something, called Robert Burridge, a mathematician. No, oh, yes, I can't remember the name. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm going back quite a long time. Mm. This would be in the 60s, actually. Yes. This, is a, this college being King's College, Cambridge. <laughs> yes. Just for the viewers, <laughs> viewers of YouTube. Yes. Um, is there anything to say before you went to your first school? Do you remember anything at all about your infancy up to, that, up to first school? No, not really. It, it was sort of comfortable and middle class. And, in in um, W1? In no, 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 no. We lived in Rygate in Surrey. Oh, right. um, after my father became, in, in 1931, I think, the medical officer of health of the borough of Rygate mm. in Surrey. We, we lived there mm. thereafter. And what was, where was your first school? Um, well, the kindergarten school was in in my in yes. Mm. Um, I don't remember a great deal of, uh, about that, although I do remember that we had an extra term, I think, in the summer of 1940, because nobody could go around holiday or anything, mm. and so we had an extra, extra term. Mm. Were you affected by the war at all? Yes, um, because, um, I mean, clearly nobody was aiming uh, to bomb Brighton as a target, but it was 20 miles south of London, mm. a direct sort of path mm. uh, from the continent of Europe. And so um, um, we, we slept in the scullery of our house every night, which had been sort of fortified mm. with great huge pillars put in to held the ceiling up and colossal doors which swung over the windows in order to mm. prevent flying glass and so on. Mm. And we were, uh, and my father wasn't usually there, it's only my mother and my sister and myself and, and the maid who was part of the house. And we were used to sleep on mattresses on the floor in the scullery. And this went on, of course, for a very long time. Mm. And did you have any, uh, just at that very early age, any particular hobbies? I and mean, did you go out into the countryside collecting things or read a lot? Or um... No, I don't think I could care mm. to have done either of those things. Um, um, well, let's take you on to your preparatory school. Yeah. Uh, where, where was that? That was about. It was called The Hawthorns, and um, it, it was about f four miles away from Rygate, um, but 
lived actually in Red Hill on the way to Merston. I don't know if you know that area at all. Um, there's a, a, a sort of road junction called Gatton Point, and it was um, a large sort of yellow and brick house with quite extensive grounds that uh, the headmaster had bought and turned into a prep school in 1926. And it had about 70 pupils, all boys, I suppose. Boarding, was it? Boarding. Um, there were three. You either boarded full time, or you boarded for the week and went home yeah. at the weekend, or you were a day boy. And yeah. I suppose a majority of the day boys and yeah. of the boarders who were about a quarter, yeah. um, I think half went home at the weekend, which I did, and yeah. half didn't. Do you remember anything about the school? Any any outstanding events or teachers or horrors or joys? Um, well, um, again, uh, the war plays mm. a certain amount of a part in it. Um, I went in September of 1941, and earlier in that year, um, they'd had a bomb which landed in the grounds. And this was a very big event in my life, a small boy. So basically, you were either there when the bomb fell or you weren't. <laughs> there was nothing you could do to make it up if you hadn't been there when the bomb fell. It didn't kill anybody or do any enormous damage, but it, it was a big event. Um, and we all used to sleep in the cellars, um, certainly for a couple of years, I suppose. Um, and it, it was humane. Uh, the, 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 they clearly had to sort of alter um, the way they ran the place as a result of the war because we were able to put and then uh, were unavailable mm. to teach. And so one had women, which I think there's some women, which I suspect they never had before, and some sort of recycled <laughs> uh, colonial veterans. Mm. And I can certainly remember one occasion this a bit later in 1944, playing cricket, and um, a V1 sort of appeared overhead with was, was standing on the cricket field, and the engine cut out, which meant it was going to do a nose dive to, to the earth and blow up. And we were all standing around, sort of looking rather apprehensively at this thing. <laughs> um, and the rather wonderful old man, um, who was a recycled colonial veteran, Sort of waved his stick and said, Play on, boys! <laughs> that's, <laughs> the, that's the Dunkirk <laughs> spirit. <laughs> uh, no, it, it was, uh, I think, unexciting, uh, mm. but uh, humane. Mm. Um, no beatings or. I mean, very little. Mm. Or hazings or. No, torture. I mean, the, the, the was corporal punishment that they must mm. used is extremely mm. little. Mm. Where, where you mentioned cricket, were you beginning to get interested in games at all? Uh, no, it, um, I mean I was very bad at games and the school was fairly bad. We usually lost more matches than we won. Mm. After, after that um, you went on to Sedba. Yes. Um, why did you go to Sedba? It's a long way away from... Well largely because uh, my parents didn't want me to go to the headmaster the school, the headmaster of the pet school we wanted me to go to, which was his old school. Mm. Um, I better not name it. Um, but they thought it was all rather sissy and put the housemaster, who I was designed, um, for whose house I, I was sort of um, destined. Mm. They thought it was homosexual. <laughs> they didn't like to tell any of this to the headmaster, so they thought it was a good idea that I should do the scholarship exam to send her, which was the week before. But, oh, I see. But I mean, the fact, that, the fact you couldn't go to a school they they wanted left all the other schools in England open to you. Yes, it did. Um, I mean, in those days, I was meant to be doing a scholarship exam, mm. and the schools were all divided into two, mm. and one lot did it one week, and the other lot did it the next week. And I suppose they alternated mm. or shuffled the list or something. Uh, but um, the, the school to which I was destined was in the second. Mm. And my parents said, well, you better have a go to sort of get his hand in by trying somewhere else first. So their master slightly 
reluctantly said, well, all right, if you insist, where do you suggest? <laughs> you know, so my mother's looked at the list and said, well, why not try Sedba? Um, largely because, having been herself at school at Heighton mm. in Liverpool, mm, yes. she knew uh, that. Mm. lots of her friend's brothers had mm. been there, and she'd, she'd never been there, but she liked the sound mm. of the place. And she didn't think it was sissy. <laughs> Toughen you up a bit. <laughs> um, can you remember, I mean, your first arrival at Sedba, your, your well, early My first time arrival... There? Um, was of course to do the scholarship exam. Yes. Um, we stayed in the sanatorium. Um, well, I was sort of struck, I think, by um, the attractiveness of the place. Um, and, and sort of how large everybody seemed to be. <laughs> uh, and I can actually quite well remember my interview by J.H. Um, Bruce Lockett uh, in his garden. I mean, it, it places it in time, because I remember he was asking questions about the independence of India, <laughs> um, which was, of course, a very live mm. topic in the summer of 1947. Mm. Uh, I was actually spending a term at a co-educational school at Robin Hood's Bay, and he said, how did I like that? And I said, well, it was, it was all right, but it wasn't very civilized, I said. <laughs> Well, I hope you don't think all schools in the north of England were uncivilised. <laughs> Why was it in that garden? Oh, and this was in the schoolhouse, was it? Yes, it was schoolhouse. Oh, yes. Why, why well, it was a nice day in the summer, I think. Mm. Just a pleasant place to interview people. Uh, did you get to know Bruce Lockhart better later on or not? Better, yes. Mm. Um, because I arrived at quite a young age in his French set mm. in the lower sixth form, I suppose it was, and um, he was so horrified by my French accent <laughs> uh, that he asked me to go to the schoolhouse to have private sessions with him mm. in order uh, to teach me how to speak French. Uh, and actually, for one reason or another, he was not usually there when I turned up or he was delayed watching some match or other, so I don't think it was a very successful <laughs> relationship. But, but one did get to know him a bit, mm. yes. Um, you later on went and did history. Was it, was it obvious that you were going to do uh, an arts stream or were you interested in other subjects as well earlier on? No, it was obvious mm. from the outset. I actually I don't know if you remember the way the forms were organised yes, in those days, but I went straight into what was called the fourth classical, mm. which had actually made one's choice. I mean, I think it was very enjoyable for those who were able to shed subjects they didn't like at a very early age, but educationally, really quite undesirable. Mm. Uh, but, but actually, one's choice was already made by 13. Mm. I went at a lower level. I went into three, three B or something, or the you know the, the level. The well, then you did have a choice. Yes, you could yeah. bifurcate. Uh, yeah. Um, so can I mean we'll come on to Andrew Morgan in a minute. But are there any other teachers at Sedba who you remember? Well, I certainly remember Christopherson with mm. with, with great affection. Mm. Um, Chris Devers, he was known as. Yes. He was housemaster of Lupton and um, class assist, was he? I can't remember what he taught, but. He certainly did teach um, Latin. I didn't think he taught any Greek, but he taught some history mm. and he taught some divinity. Mm. Uh, and he was um, the foremaster of a very good form called um, 5A Classical. Mm. Were you in that? No, I went up the history yeah. side all the time. Lower sixth history, which they had then. Well, you couldn't. Uh, I may have been, I mean, I, I, don't, I think I. Well, it, w it was a remarkable form because, on the whole, um, the people in it were rather young, mm. and on the whole, the people in it were rather bright. And Christopherson, um, although we all viewed him with great affection, he was also quite a formidable sort of figure, and um, everyone was very keen to please him. Uh, I, if 
find myself in his form my second term. And one did school certificate as it still was that summer. Mm. Um, Saint Dick was a very Um, it, it, it was a very good learning environment, that form. Everybody was very competitive. Um, and I, I, I mean, for some reason, I recall we were doing some American history, and he said he would give 30 marks to anybody who learnt the Gettysburg speech by how it was able to recite it. So no <laughs> one duly did so. And I could just about recite it now. Really? Gosh. Mm -hmm. I was very short, of course. <laughs> I won't get you to do it on camera, but I, I believe you. Um, before we go on to the, the Cleo and so on, um, what what other things were you doing at Tedbert? Were, were you a runner? I became a runner. I wasn't a natural runner. Mm. Uh, but I certainly wasn't a rugby football player. Mm. And if you didn't play rugby football every day, you ran. And mm. um, I, I had no natural ability, but I actually got to like it. And it was something which you could achieve reasonable success just by trying hard. You know. mm. um, so you I, I did actually get to like that. And mm. Where were you in the 10, ten mile in the end? Well, I always failed on the big occasions. Mm. Um, I, 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 I was expected to do much better. I, I ran in it twice and I was 12th, I think, mm. on the second occasion. But I was expected to do much better. <laughs> and I had. One of my colleagues in the house came fourth, mm. I think. Um, you were at window, weren't you? Yes. Mm. And I'd always, at least I'd regularly gone faster than him <laughs> training. <laughs> <laughs> did, I mean, did you fish at all? No. I don't think, I don't think anyone in the house actually fished. Didn't they? No. They did later, when I was there, they were. Did they? Mm. It would have been a very good thing to have done. Mm. Um, and uh, how did you find this kind of uh, school motto, Dura Virum Nutrix, uh, Hardness of Men, atmosphere of well, it was short, quite tough, wasn't it? Short trousers and cold bars. Yes. Did you did you react against it at all, or do you just take it as character forming? I think I just accepted it uh, as how things were. Mm. Um, I think looking back, it was quite a tough regime, particularly when you first arrived. Yes. You had to learn all those school rules and all, yes. the, all the runs and everything. Yes. Um, and fag. And, 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 um, yes. And, um, people were quite ready to visit your transgressions on you. Yes, well I was going to ask whether you, whether you were beaten or... Oh yes, I think almost everybody was. Mm. And did you administer beatings? Yes, mm. in, in, in two course, mm. certainly. But there again, I think one just treated it as part of life. Mm. Were, you, were there other things that I mean, what were your hobbies? Were you interested in music? No. Have you there ever seen? <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, I'm not musical, hmm. uh, but I also actually was rather discouraged from um, pursuing musical interests by a rather wonderful man. I don't know if you knew him, called Peter Newell. No. He um, was the house tutor. He was, the, he was in charge of the classical sixth hmm. form. Uh, he was the house tutor of uh, Cedric House. He then became, and he was one of the two school chaplains. Uh, he was then the headmaster of Bradford Grammar School, and he ended up. Well, then he was the headmaster of the King's School, Canterbury, um, and he then retired to a parish in Kent, the name of which I forget, um, and died very soon after that. But he had a new. Very, very successful career um, as a headmaster and teacher, and he was, um, I mean, he was a very, very good teacher, but I remember him saying to me, don't dissipate your energies. I <laughs> 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 mean, very much contrary to the culture of the school. He, um, 
he thought people were trying to do too many things. And that applied to singing and, and uh, music as well as yes. games and things? Yes. Um, I mean, Peter Newell was very... I mean, he took... I mean, he regarded himself as having a sort of um, pedagogic constituency of all bright boys, so it didn't matter whether you were in his classical sixth form or, or the history of him or whatever. He took an interest in you if he thought to mm. prize and promise him you out on half days and so. Was Atty B there? Yes, he was. Did you come across him at all? Yes. I mean, I, I never had the same sort of relationship with him that I did with Peter Newell. Mm. He was at Upton too. Yes. Upton yes. Um, I mean, you said you didn't, you weren't musical in the sense of playing instruments and so on, but do you like, do you listen to music? Yes. Just. Just. Um, my wife is even, uh, I mean, she is more unmusical than me, as so I think she'd be the first to admit. Um, so, um, I mean, we do not buy tickets to concerts. Mm. Uh, mm. On the other hand, when we go to one, as we did a few months ago, um, we actually enjoy it mm. uh, very much. So, mm. uh, but neither of us is knowledgeable or mm. uh, um, uh, couldn't possibly describe myself as a music lover, mm. an extremely ignorant. You mentioned Peter Newell as a clergyman. Um, often around the age of 16 and 17, people are confirmed or not, and people either take to or against organised religions. Uh, what was your experience? I went through a highly um, pietistic phase um, and um, had ambitions to, um, to take any orders and so on. And actually, on the day I left school, I went off with Peter Newell to spend the night with an old Salopian friend of his who was then the Bishop of Wakefield. The um, famous, not the famous Bishop of Wakefield, there was one who used to come to Sedbur and confirm people and give sermons and so on. I've forgotten his name now. Anyway. Well, was this was the man who was translated to Chichester, mm -hmm. called Roger Wilson, mm -hmm. and, and was the Bishop of Chichester for very mm -hmm. many years. Nice man. Mm -hmm. So yes, the answer is I, I uh, did go through a sort of religious phase. Mm. And what happened after that? I mean, did you continue? Why didn't you become a, a reverend? Well, it rather f faded during national service. Mm. I mean, I, I continued to be a believer, but I didn't see myself any longer as, um, as a clergyman. Mm. And what, what has your position since then been? Well, I'm still a believer, I'm mm. uh, churchgoers and so on. Mm. Mm. We're pretty dutiful churchgoers. Mm. Anglicans? Yes. Yeah. Um, le well, let's get on to um, your last year in the history of six. You were in Cl Clio, were you? Or yes. Were you? I was in Clio, actually, for <laughs> a very long time. Were you? It was getting on for three years. Three years? How was that? Two years? Was three years? Um, well, Two years and two terms. Mm -hmm. And was Andrew Morgan your teacher most of the time? Uh, throughout. Yeah. Um, Monty Christopherson mm -hmm. um, also taught some English history. And there were, um, a man who you probably remember called Bill Long. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. They taught English. Epi Long. Yes. Yeah. Bill Long. Um, yes. They called him now. Yeah. We used to call him Epi Long, yes. Yeah. Um, and he was actually very good pop. His, his own degree, I think, was in either French or German. Yes, so French. Mm -hmm. French. From a French university, I think. Yes. He was also a good rugger player, I think, uh, as well. I thought he taught rugger as well, but... Yeah, I'm sure he didn't. He didn't have. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm conflating memories. I'm sure he didn't. Mm. Um, he'd spent most of, of the war in German hands, because mm. I think he was in, in France when... Mm. And as I say, his degree was not in English, uh, so that to some extent I think he was a very good teacher because it was a joint mm. learning experience really. Mm. Um, I had these set books and so on, uh, which he, I think, was quite often reading for the first time as well. Mm. And um, 
that he was a very, very, very nice man. Mm. Tell, t I mean, we were both taught by Andrew Morgan. Tell, tell me, uh, you spoke very warmly about him at his 70th birthday, um, but um, can you give a character or a teaching description of Andrew? Yes. Um, I mean, I was in the, the, the lower sixth form when he arrived, and he, um, I mean, he was actually, well now it realises, um, very close in age to the people he was teaching. I think he left Tunbridge in 1942, went into the Royal Navy, served in southern regions. the end of the war went to Oxford and then came straight to Sedbury as the senior history master. Um, as a result of his tutor at Queen's College Oxford, John Prestridge, mm -hmm. having himself taught uh, history at Sedbury, and I think he commended this bright young pupil of his uh, to the school. Um, so that Andrew arrived as a hugely ambitious, energetic, alert, sort of vibrant, um, Welshman. <laughs> um, rather uh, rather challenging everybody's opinions, um, and uh, certainly sort of holding opinions that were not um, conventional in the place, so that um, I think he made people think of uh, a little more. Um, and he was a very good teacher. And, the subject, particularly the sort of A-level years, people would now call it, um, I found sort of hugely exciting. One had these set books, and one really got very, very excited by them. The original um, a text was the first time I'd ever really um, been expected to read with um, the sort of raw material of, of history. And, um, he was brilliant at making it come alive and um, keeping one's interest. It was a very, very good year. Mm. He, uh, when you say he, he challenged people, his, he was slightly, for a place like Sedbury, he was quite far to the left, wasn't yes. he? He yes, used to get, get us to read the New Statesman at that time. Yes. Um, I mean, he certainly wasn't. I mean, said it wasn't extreme in his left-wing opinions, but he was certainly further to the left than most of the teaching staff would have been. Mm. Still is, as a matter of fact. Yeah. <laughs> I, rem I remember you um, saying in your talk about him that he kind of opened a magical or a gate into a, a new imaginary world through his teaching. Well, he certainly did that for me. Mm. I think... Um, I think it's part of being 16 or something, mm -hmm. um, and you've spent years sort of, um, sort of absorbing information uh, without anybody really paying any attention to what you think about any of it, and then suddenly you find yourself in a state where people are saying, well, what do you think about this? You know, is this a good thing or a bad thing? Um, should he have done this or shouldn't he? What would you have done? Um, and um, so I think it's an enormously exciting uh, moment in almost anybody's educational life. Mm. Um, and you know, I, I, I guess uh, you know, sort of personal development and everything sort of comes into it. I, mean, I assume, but I've never really discussed this, that an awful lot of people have this sort of excitement. 